Howdy, y'all. Uh, this is Dr. John back for another Thursday afternoon of exciting, scintillating information, or at least information. And uh, I'll be here for about half an hour. Sometimes, as you know, I stay up to an hour, um, typically around half an hour. I find that it's harder to digest longer bits of information. And so this week, I received no requests that I'm aware of for uh, topics that people want to talk about. So I picked one of my favorites, and I'm going to talk about that today. And I hope you're getting our newsletter. If you're not, please let us know so we can put you on the newsletter list. And I would love it if you would tell your friends, relatives, neighbors about the newsletter. Again, it's free. You know, it's just going out into the ether. And uh, it's interesting. <clears throat> I get a lot of, it seems like an unreasonable amount of positive uh, comments, a uh, number of positive comments and feedback about this show, right? It's a really simple thing. I just get on here and talk for half an hour and just kind of roll with it. But I've gotten a lot of really, really great compliments. And the interesting thing to me is that most of the compliments have come from extremely bright people who are professionals. Right. I get a lot of acupuncturists that watch this, uh, again, kind of an unreasonable number in, in my mind. I get a lot of other people in medical professions, and I get really good feedback from them. So I think it would be safe if you want to turn your friends, relatives, neighbors onto it. You know, and all it takes is a click to get rid of me. So anyway, I invite you to invite them, and uh, let's get this show rolling. You know, as Buckminster Fuller once said, it's all about achieving a critical mass. And critical mass is about 10% of the population. Now, we're never going to get to that level of critical mass, but I would like to get to a level that we can actually make some changes. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today is changes that you can make in how you look at your labs, how you analyze your health that could double, triple, quadruple uh, your lifespan, really, it's that it's that real. The some of the tiny little shifts that we can make based upon observing accurate descriptions and values for your blood work. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> I'm going to take one thing in particular and focus on it. And I invite your comments and questions. Looks like there are a couple in there now, huh, Catherine? Is yeah, there's a question. Okay, what is it? Uh, regarding apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar. What's the question? I forgot to write John's answers before. Do I drink some? What time of day or with food? Can I do so by adding it to a dressing or putting it in cooked food? Great question. Apple cider vinegar is so versatile, has so many uses. It seems for years, it's like I just kind of blew it off. You know, I knew that apple cider vinegar had a lot of beneficial qualities, but there were so many good things that were attributed to it. I kind of, you know, took it with a grain of salt, like, yeah, how could it be that good? Well, it's actually better than I thought. And so apple cider vinegar has been used for a very, very long time for health. And what I used to use apple cider vinegar for primarily is for my anemic patients, uh, the ones that had low iron levels and or low B12 levels. So microcytic, meaning small cell or macrocytic, meaning large cell anemias, because the small cell is a iron deficiency. And if you don't have enough stomach acid, you can't absorb iron properly. And macrocytic is generally a B12 deficiency. And if you don't have a very acidic stomach, you can't absorb B12. So either way, you're in trouble. And it's one of the reasons a lot of my vegetarian patients and I'm not against being a vegetarian. I was vegetarian for 20 years and vegan most of that time. But I do have a problem with that diet in children. If the, we have children that are vegan or vegetarian and they're picky eaters, they need to have blood tests done quite regularly, or they need to just automatically get some form of supplementation for iron and B12. Because particularly in growing children, deficient deficiencies in either of those can really cause growth problems, it cause neurological problems, it can cause brain problems, et cetera. So you wanna be really careful. Um, so the reason uh, I was using apple cider vinegar is I would have people either drink it or uh, marinate their meat in it if they were having meat, 
or use it as a salad dressing, et cetera, anything to get apple cider into your gut because that increase in acidity from the vinegar will increase the absorption of iron and vitamin B12. And so it was very, very powerful for that. Now, the danger of taking apple cider vinegar is in people whose iron levels are too high and that because iron levels that are too high can lead to excessive oxidation and cause more cardiovascular problems. So in people that have high iron levels, I do not want them to do apple cider vinegar before a meal that has a lot of iron in it. And in those people, I still want them to do apple cider vinegar, but I want them to do it before a high carbohydrate meal. Now, one of the benefits of apple cider vinegar taken before a meal is that it blocks a particular enzyme that causes the breakdown of starches to simple sugars. And so by blocking that, there is less sugar released into the bloodstream and it will lower postprandial or after meal uh, blood sugars by 20 to 40 points, which is very, very substantial. And so this can make a huge difference. So when to take it? If you're doing it to acidify your stomach for absorption, you should do it very close to your meal because you want that acidic acidity there in the stomach. If you're doing it to block carbohydrate absorption, same thing. Use it very close to your meal so that it's in your gut to block breakdown of the starches into simple, simpler sugars. If you're doing it for any of the other dozen reasons you can do apple cider vinegar for positive results, and I'm not going to go into all of those right now. Maybe I'll do a whole show on that at some point, but then you can take it anytime. Take it between meals, etc. And so apple cider vinegar, generally just before your meal, or if you're using it to absorb more iron and B12, you want to do a marinade. If you're going to have, you know, if you're going to have a steak or chicken or whatever, do a marinade so that the meat gets soaked in that. So you're going to get better absorption of the iron and the B12. So great question. All right. So now I'm going to share my screen with you. I'm going to go through the newsletter that Catherine sent out today. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We get so many compliments on the newsletter. I really appreciate it. This isn't something that we spend weeks going on and send through multiple editing processes, et cetera. So you're going to find a, a spelling error or a syntax error. So hopefully just kind of live with that and, you know, enjoy the information that's there. Again, we'd love for you to uh, pick up a copy of The Sweet Spot. Again, it's very, very inexpensive. And the reason we'd like you to buy it is because that gets the numbers up. It looks better. But also, if you do a review or a rating on it, it comes from a verified purchaser, which gives it a lot more, a lot more weight. So anyway, a little help would be appreciated. Thanks. So here we go. And uh, just a reminder, we now have appointments available seven days a week. And I've never had a staff that I was this happy with. I am so delighted with my staff right now. Everybody is very, very, very good at their job. And everybody has slightly different areas that they focus on. You know, my wife does sports medicine and orthopedics. Uh, Catherine and I do functional medicine and um, general tra traditional Chinese medicine. So we combine those together, a lot of lab reading, a lot of consultation, et cetera. And then Gabby and Aaron uh, do a lot of sports medicine. They work a lot with Jenny, but also do other things. Um, and a couple of them do some really cool things. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about cognition support, and we're going to approach that from a most unexpected direction. Now, how many would of you would think of, you know, you're sitting down to dinner, and you're worried because your cognition is getting a little worse, you're having difficulty finding words, etc. So the remedy is to reach for your salt shaker. Yeah, not too many people think that. Now, also, it's like every other topic, every other food, every other supplement, uh, nothing is perfect for everybody, right? And so with sodium, table salt, sodium chloride, uh, some people are desperately in need of more, and some people desperately need to get rid of their salt shaker. 
Okay, now the way you would know for sure is to do a blood test. It's a $6 test to test for all of your electrolytes. I mean, sodium is one, but there are about, gosh, I never counted, 13 to 15 other tests on there. So they're about 50 cents a piece. So incredibly inexpensive. Now, one of my favorite topics, um, and I spend a lot of time on it in the book, more than I do on most chapters, and the reason is, in the United States, we have become extremely salt phobic. Now, there's a good reason for that. Our high sodium levels in the blood from eating too much sodium chloride or, or table salt is a problem in terms of mortality. People that have high uh, serum sodium levels do die at a higher rate than people with perfect sodium levels. And there are a lot of things that are elevated in terms of risks, and we'll get into those. But what people don't realize is there is equal danger, absolutely just as much danger from having low sodium levels. Now, I bet you doctor, your doctors never told you that. They've told you to watch your salt, don't eat too much salt, et cetera, particularly if you have high blood pressure. Now, that may be perfect advice and it may be may not be perfect advice and you don't know unless you get your serum sodium tested so uh as with many many of these lab tests the ranges that you see for a so-called standard range or a reference range are enormous they're generally calculated as being um two standard deviations from the mean, and that means they just take 95% of the population and they call that normal. And if you're in the two and a half percent above that or the two and a half percent below that, they say you have a problem. Well, what an idiotic thing. What if everybody in a population eats too much salt? Well, then those values are worthless. What if everybody in, in that uh, population eats not enough salt? then those values are worthless. Iodine, which is one of the things I'm gonna mention later today, we live in a culture that is very, very iodine deficient. And if you take the 95% that are within two standard deviations of the mean, the majority of them, the vast majority are actually iodine deficient, which will lead to thyroid problems and a whole range of other issues. So. To me, that's a very poor way to look at these lab values. And so what we've done in the sweet spot is to look at the research, lots and lots and lots of research, looking at the actual values, the research studies that are looking at the actual values that are the healthiest for human beings. And they're quite clear, by the way. There are multiple papers on every topic that I looked at, most of them very well done or at least many of them very well done, enough that we could get really good studies. And what you'll see for almost all of them are what are called U-shaped curves. And I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute. So in a U-shaped curve, the very, very bottom of the curve is what's called the sweet spot, or what we call the sweet spot at, uh, at any rate. And that's the area that has the, if you're in that range, you have the lowest mortality risk. Then as you start to go up either way, going up to the right or to the left, to the right generally being uh, too high a level, to the left generally being too low a level, you see the mortality risk goes up either way. And this is absolutely true with serum sodium. Uh, and again, I've never, ever had a medical doctor tell me to uh, or even look at my sodium levels to see if they might be too low. I don't think any, I think one patient I've had where their doctor said, your sodium level's dangerously low. And it was dangerously low. It wasn't just a little bit low, but otherwise it's just kind of ignored. The topic again, mostly occurs in conversations regarding blood pressure and to minimize salt intake. Now here you see it's a U-shaped curve doesn't really matter in this case what it is. I just want you to see what we're looking at. Now here, if you're in this area right at the bottom, that means you have the lowest mortality over some future time period. And most of these studies in the book were done over about 10 years. Uh, and then as you start up here, you can see there can be a fairly sharp curve up 
uh, on the high end or up on the low end. And we certainly see this with sodium. Now, there's something called a J-shaped curve also, which I'm not going to get into much. In a J-shaped curve, there's a very short arm on this side. So big arm going upwards. Um, and an example for that for would be, say, alcohol intake. There's zero, one drink, one and three quarters drinks for men. And then it starts to get worse. So the the, the lowest mortality from alcohol consumption uh, is between one and one and three quarters drinks for men and about three quarters of a drink for women. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and start drinking alcohol, but if you are and you're in that range, I'm not going to worry about it. And then as you go towards zero, actually, the mortality rate goes up. But as you go on the high side, it goes up much higher because there's essentially, well, there is a limit to how much you can drink, but it's a lot more than going to the left. So that would be a J-shaped curve. <clears throat> now, if you get too low, and again, this is shocking to most people, there's a much greater chance. And when I say much, I mean much, much greater chance of death from stroke. There's a higher rate of injury or death due to falling. And to me, that's the most important single thing is people get what's called orthostatic hypotension. They stand up, they get lightheaded, they fall and hit their head, and they bleed out. Uh, so very dangerous. There's a higher rate of bone fractures. And again, this is independent of falling. Even without the, the, the increase in falling, the bones get weaker and they have a higher rate of bone fractures. Again, a higher rate of certain types of strokes, which I indicated above, and higher rate of certain types of cancers. So you definitely don't want your sodium to be too low. And now when I'm talking about this being low, I'm talking about not a standard reference range low that you'd find on a blood chemistry test. I'm finding that within what's called normal, uh, you can get these incredibly increased mortality risk. So here, when your sodium gets under 137, which is considered normal on all of the major labs and the major major HMOs in the in Northern California, when it gets under 137, you start seeing more adverse events. When you get over 142, you start seeing more adverse events. So that's a relatively tight range there. And again, there's a lot of apparent and uh, truly uh, huge differences in mortality within those tiny changes in sodium range. And again, since we've become a culture that's so very salt intake consciousness, uh, which is generally a good thing, we have often thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And so uh, salt is one of the most precious things on the earth, on the planet. Salt comes from the same root word, as salary or sal, and uh, Roman soldiers were partially paid with a salt ration. And people traveled hundreds of miles to get salt. There were trade routes set up worldwide to trade for salt because it was so critical uh, to have in your diet. And also it made food taste better. With By the way, when we get between 136 and 139, now, most of these labs, let me take a look here and let me read from the sweet spot for just a moment. And the a, a major national laboratory, one of the top labs and the one that I send people to, says your sodium range is normal between 134 and 144. A uh, major HMO in the area says you're normal from 135 to 145. And we make the bold assertion, and not just us, Catherine and I, we just are backing it up with the research that you can read, but we're certainly not the first to come out with this. Um, healthy research values are 139 to 142. And when you, the difference between 136, which is considered normal in all these labs, and 139, the difference is twice, double the mortality risk over the next 10 years. So twice the chance of dying if your sodium is still in the normal range on these, uh, according to these labs, but you're low by our range. And again, we're very salt conscious. It's a good thing because if you get too much salt and your sodium levels get too high, then your blood gets very thick and sludgy. It gets harder to move. Your blood pressure goes up and the heart attack rate goes up. 
but you want it perfect. Now, because of a rampant epidemic of adrenal problems, this is enormous. This has been enormous for decades from in the US, people burn the candle at both ends. You know, they're just constantly thinking, working on stuff. It's like they have a weekend and literally they're soccer moms and dads driving three kids all over Northern California or further to go to tournaments. And each of the kids has a different tournament in a different city, and they've got to figure a way to drive all of them. It's insanity. Uh, and this is not something that was the case 20, 30, 40 years ago. This is a very recent phenomenon. But in my practice, Every week and pretty much daily, I see low sodium levels and patients are often having symptoms from those low sodium levels. It's not just that, oh, look on your lab. But when I start asking them questions, they're having symptoms. Now, symptoms of low sodium are orthostatic hypotension. Again, that's when I mean, you get dizzy when you stand up, uh, oftentimes unexplained nausea and some cognitive problems because you're not getting, in this case, enough blood to your brain, uh, and so you'll have cognition issues. Now, most of my patients, personally, are chronically ill and middle-aged or older. I see very, very few healthy 25-year-olds. My wife sees those. Uh, Gabby sees them. The other people in my office get to see them. They're seeing sprained ankles and sore muscles and sore shoulders. My patients tend to be older. They're coming in for eye, eye and vision problems. They're coming in for thyroid, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, et cetera. And so they're chronically ill, middle-aged. Most have, have had, they may not currently have, but have had very intense lifestyles. And they're kind of worn out. Literally, they're just worn out. And they're in a state that we commonly now call adrenal fatigue or adrenal exhaustion. Now, there are very, very good lab tests to determine adrenal fatigue and adrenal exhaustion. We do two tests in our uh, clinic, hands-on tests to determine adrenal exhaustion, actually three, to determine adrenal fatigue and adrenal exhaustion. But then we'll back that up by sending people to the lab and getting tested. And so they have worn out adrenals. Now, this problem is has skyrocketed, absolutely crazy, off the wall, skyrocketed with the pandemic over the last few years. One of the things that happens in severe viral infection is that the adrenal glands get even more worn out. And we've known that very clearly since the uh, 1918, 1919 flu epidemics, when they would do autopsies and find that people's uh, adrenals were almost unidentifiable, that they'd been so used up. And that's because inner part of the adrenals called the medulla creates and supplies your body with your so-called stress hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, keep your heart beating, to move blood to your extremities, uh, to fight the tiger that's attacking you. And then the adrenal cortex, which is the outer layer, uh, is supplying your own hydrocortisone type of chemicals, which put out the fires in your body. It's like prednisone, which it was really discovered and utilized based upon studies of the human adrenal glands. And so when your adrenals aren't putting out enough of those corticosteroids, you can take external exogenous corticosteroids to kind of get you through the emergency. But this adrenal fatigue state is very problematic. And so we talk about cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine. And, you know, those terms have been around long enough. I mean, 20 years ago, almost nobody knew what those terms were. But now everybody knows, and they're all familiar with adrenal fatigue, although they mostly don't understand what's happening because the key mover there, although all of those hormones are very important, but the key mover is a hormone called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is produced in a very narrow outer layer of the adrenal glands, and aldosterone is a primary controller of sodium to potassium ratios. If your potassium gets too high, you have danger of heart attacks. If it gets too low, you don't have nerve conduction properties that are ad adequate. Sodium, same thing. If it's too high or too low, you get problems. Well, if you get an increase in sodium or, or in potassium, your aldosterone and the other hormones, are, if they're working properly, 
will tell your kidneys to pee out more sodium or more potassium, whichever the case might be. And you, that's fine. You can go. You, that's how it works. It's supposed to work that way. But if you have low aldosterone, uh, aldosterone when it's low will ha- you will always have low sodium. It's one of the things that occurs with low aldosterone. So we will check aldosterone if we have someone that has habitually low sodium levels, and it's almost always off the charts low. So with that low aldosterone, you have low sodium. If you have low sodium, then you don't pull water into the bloodstream to balance the amount of sodium. So you don't have as much blood volume. If you don't have as much blood volume, you have mild hypovolemia, not as much blood volume. And then when you stand up, the you don't have enough blood or blood pressure to get the blood up into your brain. So you get lightheaded and you can actually pass out. Aldosterone is a key, key player in this entire blood pressure and wellness balance. And so this low aldosterone is really common in my patients. So it, like I said, it is one of the things we look for. Hypo means low or lower. Bulimia uh, retain, uh, pertains to low volume. And in this case, it's low blood or fluid volume. Now, I want to actually ma- have a caveat here. When MDs or emergency personnel say hypovolemia, they're talking severe hypovolemia uh, of someone that's ble- bleeding out or is going into shock and it can be lethal. We're talking about minimal levels of hypovolemia, such that people just get dizzy when they stand up, they're not as functional, their cognition declines. Still a problem. And of course, it's very difficult to test for it. How do you do it? All of your blood tests, your blood counts, etc., are done per unit of volume. So they take a particular volume of blood and they count the number of red cells and the number of white cells and et cetera. Well, they can't count the blood volume because they'd have to take all your blood out and measure it and then try to get it back, back into you. So not very convenient to do in a clinical setting. So it's not addressed because it's too hard to address. Fortunately, with Chinese medicine, we have a huge advantage. We take pulses. Those of you that have seen me or another practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, you've had your pulses taken. And you see there are three fingers on this person's radial artery, and they're checking the pulses at three different locations, and they're testing at multiple depths. And each of those pulses has 27, 28 if you're talking about a death pulse, basically, 27 pulses, and you have nine positions on each wrist. So you start multiplying out the possibilities, and it's incredibly high, the matrix there. And so when we're feeling pulses, that's what we're analyzing. Now, one of the pulses that's actually extremely, I mean, as soon as I touch someone, it's obvious, is hypovolemia. And in hypovolemia, the blood volume is so low, it doesn't fully fill up the radial artery. So the the artery has a very different feel to it. Uh, I can press down into it. There's very little resistance, kind of mushy. And so we know that there's at least some level of hypovolemia. And so we can feel that in the pulses. Now, when I feel that, I will ask my patients, do you ever get dizzy when you stand up? And at least 90% of the time, they'll say, oh yeah, isn't that normal? Or, oh yeah, it's been happening for the last two years. So obviously it's not normal and it is dangerous and we can tell from the pulses. And again, then we do a couple of in-office tests uh, to further examine that. One's called a Raglan's test, which is having you lie down, check your blood pressure, have you stand up, check your blood pressure again uh, on three, timed over three different uh, tests. And we get to see if you have hypovolemia. We also get to see if you have postural orthostatic tachycardia or POTS, or we can start pointing at dysautonomia, which is another condition that is really skyrocketed uh, post-pandemic. So anyway, we can get information on all of those just by testing the pulses. The bottom line, if you have low sodium intake, 
or you have low normal sodium intake and low aldosterone levels, either way, you'll have low serum sodium. Uh, now, there are other possible causes, but those are by far the two most common. Now, uh, in the book, uh, let's see, on page, around page 80, sodium, I talk, I tell a story about a patient that came in, mid-40s, very driven, wonderful person, type A, just really, 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 you know, speaking quickly, moving quickly, wanted to get things done, came in and she was really upset. It's like, you got to help me. You got to help me. You know, I've been to, and she named all these people, MD, functional MD, chiropractor, et cetera. And she said, and nobody can figure this out. I said, well, what's the problem? She said, every day after I do a workout, I take my daughter, put her in the car and drive her to school. And over the last two months, almost every day, I have to pull the car over to the side of the road. I am so dizzy. I am so out of it. I can't drive anymore. I'm nauseous, et cetera. And so I asked her a question that I would think is pretty obvious, but apparently other people didn't ask her, which was, what do you do? What are you doing before you drive your daughter? She said, well, I work out on my bike, uh, her Peloton. And I said, so do you just kind of cruise along? She said, oh, no, I'm driven. I used to be a competitive cyclist. I go an hour full out, just 100 percent. I'm exhausted. And I said, do you perspire much? She said, oh, my God, I have towels all around my bike because I sweat so much. I said, OK, well, I think we've got a pretty expensive fix here, but I think we can fix it. She said, oh, my God, what do I do? I said, I want you to eat half a teaspoon of salt before you work out. I'd like you to work out a little less, maybe half an hour, and then I'd like you to take electrolytes during the day. And she looked at me like I was nuts, but she agreed. She came back in a few weeks. She said, oh, my God, I'm fine. I don't have any of those episodes anymore at all. And the problem was she was burned out. She had adrenal fatigue. Her aldosterone levels were low. She wasn't holding sodium in her bloodstream. And so when she'd work out and perspire, she had even less in the way of fluids in her system, and she would get sick. She would get uh, orthostatic hypotension. She'd get nausea, et cetera. The whole fix was for about uh, probably a penny a day. So sometimes it's the easiest, easiest thing. And that's just one case I've seen. I've seen many people with very similar issues. Again, we offer in here, if you want to have a, if you're getting blood tests from another organization and you want us to look over them, just make an appointment. I'm happy to take some time and go over your blood tests and to uh, give you my assessment. Catherine uh, Black is also very, very skilled at that. And so, and often you're getting two for one. Often we're seeing two patients together. Um, and so you're actually getting, paying one fee to see two of us. So if you have questions about your lab tests or if you'd like to get some more lab tests, uh, then please contact us and we'd love to see you. So let's see, any questions? Yeah. Can urinary frequency be a symptom of high blood sodium? Yes, it can. Uh, again, your body's going to try to pee it out. Uh, high levels of urination can also be symptoms of a lot of things. It can be a symptom of high blood sugars. And in fact, one of the key symptoms uh, in diagnosing diabetes or high blood pressure, I mean, high blood sugar in kids uh, is, you know, are they peeing a lot? Are they drinking a lot and peeing a lot, right? So it can be a few different things, but the bottom line is your body is trying to get rid of uh, whatever the excess is uh, through your urine. So I recently went on an anti-inflammatory diet and it was most uncomfortable because the first night I was up to pee about every hour and a half because I had all this extra fluid that I was retaining to um, fight or to protect myself from the inflammation. And as I started to get rid of the inflammation, I didn't need the fluid anymore. And this happens a lot when we, uh, for example, do a liver cleanse, which we do a couple times a year. Uh, often, and this is more true of the women than the men, the women will lose nine to 14 pounds over the period of 10 days. Now that's not fat. You can't lose that much fat really that quickly, or you, you shouldn't, um, and you wouldn't on the liver cleanse, but it's because they are not increase, they're not causing more inflammation and they're reducing 
the already present inflammation, then their body is free to pee out the water that they've been using to protect themselves. All right. Um, you mentioned that people come to you for eye problems. Wondering what for and what you can do for them. It depends on the type. For uh, retinal problems, we get pretty good success. Uh, dry macular degeneration, uh, drusen deposits, things like that, we get pretty good success. Wet macular degeneration is usually a little too far along for us to really get much in the way of results. Um, Cataracts can often be reversed with a couple of simple types of treatments. And lately, I've been treating over the last couple of years quite a bit of glaucoma or high uh, elevated pressures in the eyes. And I've come up with a kind of uh, treatment that I, I really like for that. And we've gotten good results. And in fact, the VA is talking about taking that particular treatment and applying it broadly throughout the VA because it was so successful on a few patients. And that was with acupuncture. That was with acupuncture, yeah. Yeah, we've had great success. Okay. That's it? That's it. All right, kids. It's been happy. It's been healthy. Have it be happier and healthier this week. Have a great week. And I'll be back with you next Thursday at 3.30 uh, with Ask Dr. John. Thank you. And thank you for the sweethearts you're letting go on the screen. I love it. Bye-bye.